Hello. I forgot to start the recording, so here we are. This is the Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, December 6, 2023. <clears throat> here we are dis discussing uh, parasites, biomes, and the revolution. Yeah, someone said the word revolution and a recording started. I'm not sure if that was... <laughs> Who knows what will happen? Uh, Chris, we're not hearing you. Oh, that's right. You just muted. Actually, we're not hearing you when you're unmuted, so you've got a mic problem. How about now? Now it's working. Somehow, somehow my mute button on my microphone decided it was going to start working today. Well, that's good. Just to be yeah, confusing. Yeah, you got to get all the, um, all the revolutionary stuff on the record so that when the AI, you know, becomes sentient. So I, for one, welcome our new AI overlords. Yes. The, for the record, keep repeating that no matter how much you believe it. Every yeah. session I'm in, it's a, the rational statement <laughs> to make. <laughs> well, if they, if they allocate power in the future government structure by who said that the most, I could Oof. be president. This is, uh, yeah. is it uh, too early to bring up the basilisk? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that topic, careful, I mean, though. sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say you have to be careful. Eventually, the AI is going to understand um, when you're being sarcastic, and then you're in trouble. I feel like we're, we're at a far greater risk of the AI, assuming from the content it's trained on, that we're always sarcastic. Or that we're just <laughs> stupid brutes and should be wiped out. I mean, really. <laughs> Remember the first broadcast that any aliens will see were, are basically Hitler at the, the 36 Olympics. That's the lead. Yeah. That's the bow wave. That's the bow wave of our civilization's uh, effect on other cultures. I hope they. I hope they. They don't manage to catch that. They don't manage to miss that part. That was must see TV. Yeah. So on the sarcastic uh, AIs, or you know, uh, whether they will look at us as sarcastic. I guess you can imagine like AI is being sarcastic or earnest, depending on the training data, precisely, you know, uh, and, and the um, reform and learning, I guess, layer. Um, and this, I, 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 we wonder about this. Maybe we will need both. I guess maybe sarcastic people will get along with sarcastic AIs and earnest people, earnest AIs. So it'll uh, all be like an episode of Futurama with, uh, what's the name of the sarcastic robot? Bender. Bender. Bender, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah, I, I played a bit with ChatGPTs, uh, one of these uh, GPTs, so the modes, the, I guess, customized prompts, which is like a 10x programmer. I don't know how you, you've seen this one. It's like someone who does a code review in a very sarcastic uh, and uh, uh, passive aggressive or, more that, or like straight aggressive mode. Yeah. And it's spot on, honestly. And I can imagine like people like, uh, <laughs> like uh, appreciating these uh, tough personalities in some contexts. It's funny. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's on people's minds? Any, have, have, has everybody uncovered cool new stuff? Hey, Michael. <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out how to write a Neo book, then, which has been really fun. How to write, how to think like a Neo book and what that might mean. Uh, and and uh, ap apropos books, uh, April was just on a call this morning with her publisher, and apparently the publishing industry has been having a miserable, terrible, bad time. Like, the book books are in trouble right now. Oh, everything is in trouble in the publishing industry of all types of publishing right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'll mute while typing, yes. Oh, <laughs> unless you're Amazon, maybe. Yeah. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, why is that? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Apologies, Chris. Because April probably has of the group here, and some I know, the most recent book to come out. What kind of PR support, if any, did they give her? So her publisher is Barrett Kaler, which is not that big, uh, headquartered in Oakland. They do really interesting books. Uh, they most book publishers at most what happens is every season or every sort of release they'll pick one or two books to put some marketing energy behind and the other 20 that they publish in that period get not get nada 
So April actually hired a book publicist at launch, before launch. And like the five months before August of 21, when she launched, when it became pub, when it was available, uh, were a frenzy of activity. Just, I don't, she, I think she recorded more than a hundred podcasts, interviews, et cetera, et cetera. She got some placement in media, which was good and so forth. But if she hadn't done that on her own, uh, it would have been, you know, pretty much uh, crickets. <clears throat> she had to, she had to drum that up. And uh, did she pay in the general range of three to five thousand for her publicity for several months? It was expensive. It was a, it was at the high end of that range. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like at least they generated something for, her, unless all those podcasts were either through herself or through you. Um, if they didn't generate enough stuff, usually you can say, Hey, you did next to nothing for me. Most of the stuff I got, I got for myself, a kick back a chunk of the fee. And usually, she was, they were. yeah, she was happy with their, with their work. They were, they were quite good. <clears throat> so she went to a hundred podcasts. I'm sorry. I, I, st I got stuck on that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. She got interviewed, interviewed more than, I think it was more than a hundred times. She kept a big spreadsheet of all, you know, all the, all the things. And there was just a shit ton of, of sit down and tell us again, what was the idea of this book? And, uh, it's like kind of crazy that you repeat it over and over. Wow. Um, and, and then I guess the other question I want to know the book and I, I get just a link and then I can. Oh, the, the book title? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, I believe it's, uh, I think if you go there, you'll, you'll see the book and it's full blazing glory. Thank you. <laughs> um, also, also another spend of money. Uh, so April's, April's speaking business last year was great. Uh, then the, the pipeline really dried up this year. So she has just now this week, Get, is getting final, 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 final copy of a uh, demo reel, which uh, a few speakers have. Uh, but sh she worked with a video production house that's known nationwide, but happens to be here in Portland. And they were really good. And I think this this demo reel is pretty awesome. Um, so we'll be should be putting it on YouTube, and I'll share it out to the to the matter most when when it's available, just so you can see. Uh, just but it's. It's one of those like sort of dazzle reels or sizzle reels where you know there's really nice footage and there's now music in the background, the whole thing. It's crazy. Sorry, sorry, Bentley, go ahead. Just a quick aside. <clears throat> did uh, did it hit her radar that Doctor Who had a villain named Flux? I think while she was. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think she knows much just, about Doctor Who. No, I was <clears throat> just curious if it. If those two worlds collided, yeah, uh, they they have taken over the whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> she might find that funny. <clears throat> I think so. And Michael, I think you were you wanted to jump in when we were talking about books going down the tubes or something, or publishing in trouble. No. Uh, okay, you were part of the the interrupt conversation where we talked over each other. Apparently not. Sorry, just a second. I don't even know if I'm if I'm uh, mic'd or muted. Oh, I am. We hear you fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I might have been thinking as I, you know, to quip, but I thought only to myself. Um, yeah, books are in trouble. I've captured them all. I've got them here. <laughs> You're holding them all for ransom. Holding them hostage. <clears throat> nice. Well, books are broken. Books need to be rethought. We need to like that. That's this whole neo book experiment we're doing is a, a tiny little sliver of that. But I, I'm excited about it. It's fun. So so far as most of your neo book, you writing or are there other collaborators? So we've got calls on Mondays that used to be the sense, sense doing calls, <clears throat> which Bentley had started. We, we kind of um, took over that time slot in the programming in some way. Um, but we've been meeting, and there's four different neo books in progress. But I, mine is the only one that's being written like a neo book, meaning the other writers are writing books in Google Docs. And the neo book conceit is that books are basically rollups of nuggets that are interesting, that are that could be written to be written to be composable and reusable. So that um, <clears throat> I wrote a nugget about trust. You could write a nugget about ChatGPT. And if that was a really nice write-up of ChatGPT, 
why shouldn't that nugget appear in several different books? And uh, there's kind of an unwritten rule of books that all the content in a book should be unique and new for that book. And I'm like, screw that. Um, books should overlap. And and then the a piece of the neo book narrative is that books are just shiny objects that are well known cultural artifacts. They they attract people. <clears throat> but what's really interesting is where the nuggets are basically alive on the web as wiki like social documents. Then the nuggets can be improved, they can be reworked, they can be manifested in different ways, like in different languages easily now because auto translation is getting just better and better and better. But also you could say, you know, rewrite this at a third grade level, rewrite this for a PhD. Uh, you could do a whole much mess of stuff. And so I'm, partly what I'm trying to do is explain explore that and experiment with it. And what I'm also trying to do is uh, write enough of a neo book so that um, I can point to it and say, this is what it would smell like if it's starting to like pump. <clears throat> so doing that. Um, so have you, uh, well, I guess the first question is then, what licensing are you putting on the bits and pieces you're writing so that they can or could be reused by others potentially? At this point, it's not actually explicit in the documents, but it should, it's CC0 is kind of the way I'm thinking, because for me, and we've had several different interesting conversations about this. Pete Kaminsky cares a lot about this, and you know, there's Copy Heart. There's a whole bunch of int uh, in intriguing but often incomplete licensing schemes, but I want to write for the commons. Uh, and it turns out that if you don't protect your writing, that's bad too. You have to actually actively apply some license to your writing. Because otherwise, somebody else can apply license to your writing and, like, in some sense, appropriate it, which is not good. So then the next question after that is, are you aware of there is a huge space in mostly higher education and academia called, usually it goes by the acronym OER. Yep, or Open, Open Educational, Educational Resources. Resources. Yep. Wait, um, sorry, what is that? What do you mean? Sorry. Open Educational Resources, OER, yeah, or ahead. OER. So it's essentially most of it tends to be professors who are writing kind of open books, and they openly license it so that you can take paragraphs, pages, or chapters and reuse them in other educational resources. So that if you're doing a class, instead of saying, here's the one book you need to read, you can go out and find chapters that you want your students to read and put it into a book, or some professors have been going out and taking, you know, stuff in the public domain, usually in history courses or reading classes. Let's find short stories or things we can put in and make our own textbook. And then at the end of the course, they've got the textbook with some footnotes and analysis that go with it. And then they package it up and say, here's an OER textbook that other courses could use or take bits and pieces of and go from there, which I think is fairly similar to where the open, you know, or the neo book idea is sitting. It's just moving that idea out of the educational setting into a broader cultural setting. Yep, exactly. And and I'm really interested, for me, OER is part of sort of the leading edge of education, or one of the different leading edges of education, where it meets the ideas that I'm working with on the NeoBook project. Because I'm really interested in how education, journalism, science, policy, politics, and governance can all meet at these documents. <clears throat> so, um, Currently, those are all sort of different siloed communities that happen to share articles or blog posts or tweets or whatever. And occasionally there's like an open database. But what if those things were more integrated? And, and you know, when somebody's is making a policy decision, they could actually consult the research that researchers were, were working on, that journalists reported on, that, you know, et cetera, that students uh, had improved to all that. <laughs> Oh, cool. Thanks for that article. Chris, you've written about everything we ever talk about. It's good. <laughs> Gary, um, just so you know that the link to um, 
you, you can get to uh, where you wanted us to go, but you get a sorry page doesn't exist yet when you follow that link directly. Well, that's weird. Let me see what I, I, I used a link from my brain, which might not be updated. Uh, let's see. I mean, I, I got I got to where I was supposed to go by going to the, using the sidebar to navigate. But. Oh, you're right. Good. I think the name, oh, that's why. Okay, I'll, let me uh, see if this works. Good. So what happened was I changed the page name in my Obsidian from Neobooks Intro <clears throat> to Neobooks Introduction, and I thus broke my broke my link. <laughs> so uh, thanks for that. I am updating all of the proper places now. Appreciate it. Cool. There's the proper link. So you're working on four different um, neobooks. Yeah. So on the uh, neobook on neobooks. Uh, so um, so far, there's no separate neobook. So I myself am working on one neobook explicitly called Design from Trust, which is about that whole idea. But it. But I'm realizing that actually I have two or three other neobooks in mind already. So I've kind of started. Table of tables of contents for those, yeah. And and uh, so by myself, I can then um, weave some common nuggets across several of the books that I want to create. But it's a major thing to do one book. Never mind, like try to write four books. But there ought to be a book about neo books. That's totally true. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just saw neo books parentheses neo book in your uh... exactly that, and that's what that is. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Um, okay. And and the design from trust book has a double intro. The first intro is the neo books intro, and then the second intro is the design from trust intro. Mm -hmm. So first I say, hey, this is a neo book. This has nothing to do with design from trust, although it has a little bit to do with it. Here's what a neo book is. Then I, I, then I start sort of open up the topic of design from trust. Cool. And the idea is that the neo books intro could be a nugget that is reused by any neo book. Uh, if, if if they wanted to have an intro that explains what that is, otherwise, they could just point to it as a uh, you know they could have a sentence in their intro that says this is a neo book with a link to that page, and then they're not transcluding the text of that nugget into their book, but they're making reference to it. Uh, either way would work just fine. And one of the things that Pete and I were talking about is how do we offer how do you offer a path through nuggets with a table of contents, for example. Um, that knows which nuggets to transclude or include into the mainline text of the book artifact and which ones to ignore and just treat as links. Right? And right. Just, to con this, just to confuse things, uh, if you put a bang mark in front of a link in Obsidian, it will transclude the text of the other page into the current page, which is a, a fine and handy thing until, yeah. you start, until you start trying to think of like the repercussions for what happens then when I publish the book this way? Does that work? And Pete's site builder that I'm using for the web presence of the pages I'm, I'm using in Markdown doesn't know how to do that recursion. So those just show up as links. So I, so I don't get the effect that I'm seeing on the page when I'm trying to write in a nuggety way. So when I said at the beginning that I'm trying to write like a neo book, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, years ago, my first job was at Disneyland. And and uh, they they had a funny little story of some guy who was getting a tour behind the scenes and saying, God, every everything's fake, but it looks so real. Like, how do you make a rock look so real? And the designer like nods his head and he says, To make a to make a good rock, you have to think like a rock, um, which I've always loved. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out. And this is a little bit like working wikily or thinking like a wiki or writing in wiki style, right? It's it's a little like that, but it's a little more. Because I want everything everything you get from working Wickily is, is like, yes, 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 I want that. But now I want repurposability in other media. I want the continuity of, 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 of narratives around ideas. I don't know why you why you bounced out, Francian. It's weird. Um, and so so I'm so I'm trying to write that way, and it's challenging but not impossible and fun. And I, it's a it's a kind of hard fun I'm enjoying a lot. I'm very interesting, uh, interested in like the problem of generating like the final artifacts from the fragments. This uh, has a lot of overlap with um, some of the problems 
um, or things I'm trying to explore with Abra. So I will, um, I, I think I found the source of truth. I think essentially it, this is the root, right? Uh, so if you start, yes. yes, right. So the the book ideally should be compiled from this. Bingo. The, this this page, be, this page is meant to be the playlist of nuggets for this book. Right. Yeah. So, so essentially, um, right. So I think that you. So there's two things me apparently. You know, it's like the, the concept of table, table of contents. Uh, contents. We sort of means print these and then take each one of the links and uh, put them after, no? Because uh, like the generator of the book. Yep. And then the transcription. I mean, you, I guess you could do that, you could do it only with transcription. If, if, the, if, the, if the banks, the, the bank syntax worked recursively, you will be set, presumably. I think so. Yeah, that, that's true. Good point. Yeah, modulo, um, you know, any customization you may want to, to make, because maybe in a nugget, I, I get this. The, I, I, well, you're discussing, well, you were mentioning this. I thought of something that we discussed a few months back, I think, which is about the this idea of like levels of text, where like you know maybe you like all this fractal text approach, or where like yeah, you would like to like uh, essentially zoom in or out, or like see more or less detail. There's uh, zippered lists. Uh, Ted Nelson had zippered lists, but he also right. had another one called it was called stretch text. Right. Which we've, yes. we've and, mentioned it on, on some of our calls before. Right, right. Um, so maybe, I mean, and that would be a sort of like cherry on top to have some allowance for saying levels of text. And then when I you, you said I thought you said jury on top there for a second. I was like, ha, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, maybe I did because my accent, you know, jury on top is actually, I'm going to use that now. And that's good. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, but those seem more like, um, yeah, Jerry's or Jerry's on top. Uh, three text, thank you. And any and all suggestions on how to write better, make a better neo book, what to do with it, welcomed. And also, I'm realizing that as I get into it, limited by Markdown and Obsidian and the stuff we're trying to do, um, I'm I'm probably getting too close to what I'm doing the way I'm doing it, and I'm forgetting or not able to think more creatively about what I could be doing or how you know how to play with it more. Because <clears throat> I, I really like the idea, and I'm trying to figure out how to make it compelling enough that other people want to jump in and and you know write their own neo books next door. Right. And I want to make all the instructions for how to do that open source, so that anybody can come in and do that. So I have a, a few specific questions about the uh, possible mechanics of how to develop the new book, but I don't know if anybody else, I don't want to like uh, first thing. Uh, let's see if anybody would rather talk about something else. There being no object, wait, Michael's opening his mouth. Go ahead. Well, oh. I, was, I was just going to, to um, I, I think, Along the same lines as what Lance is saying, you know, and discussing things one might do, um, and opening up the scope. Uh, I'm thinking visuals and um, and neo books that were based more on the visual and potentially even how uh, video might be incorporated or totally. um, other formats. Totally. Um, and for <clears throat> for many of the nuggets that I'm writing, for some of the nuggets I'm writing, I've already recorded videos. I've got short videos of different kinds or explainers, and th those have the same rough content that would go in a nugget. So I'm going to put a link to the video uh, in the nugget. And and there, th these interesting questions show up about, well, should that be in metadata <clears throat> or should that be a link in the inline text uh, and just assume that everybody's got a, a, a an electronic text? and I don't intend to publish any of these as physical books, but there are certainly print-on-demand uh, services that would make that easy to do. But then you lose, you know, you lose the links uh, unless there's a link index that gets generated for those, and then somebody can scan them or type them in, or who knows what. <clears throat> so you get all these different con kind of contextual questions about as you're writing, where do you put it? Um, but then I also I kind of want to have the book available as a web of videos in my brain. 
right? Because because another thing I'm doing that I haven't done very well here yet because I've been generating a lot of pages in Obsidian that I haven't been mirroring in my brain, and it's not an easy task to go do because my link when I'm in Obsidian, I can't handily create a link to put in the brain. I have to actually push the page, wait for Pete's web builder to regenerate it, go to the website, find the page link, and then add that to my brain. So it's a really, like, it's a dumb, slow, roundabout way to, to build it. But I want the whole web of ideas to also be accessible in this strange little brain format. And, and therefore, there could be a web of videos or other visualizations linked to each other. And I'd be extremely happy if anybody else wanted to riff on the content of any of those nuggets, the way that uh, <clears throat> the way that Jonathan Colton will write a song and other and fans will create a video animation of his of his lyrics in some other crazy animated way. That'd be great. And again, if there's an, if there's any nugget that someone else wants to reuse, I would love that. And in the metadata for that nugget, one of the things that would be in the metadata uh, is a link to, um, to to other uses of the same nugget. Uh, if you right. go to the NeoBooks intro, yeah, click on that, and then go down to uh, scroll down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, uh, these uh, go to nuggets are really powerful, which it should be transcluded there, but isn't, but is a link. You go to yeah. here, read. I like this page a lot, and 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 I've moved things around a bit, trying to make them a little crisper. Um, but this is why I, this is why I think this is really kind of fun. Yes. And 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 potentially really powerful. So so here. Yeah, this is very nice. Uh, I think it's, uh, I see this as a sort of like, I don't know if you have another page like this, but it is matching a bit what I was um, looking for, which is like sort of like nugget patterns. So yep. which can, or or to, or in, a, in other terms, it would be like uh, nugget types. So the idea of a type nugget being like, you know, this is not only like what is a nugget like a name like a, 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 a you know a topic uh, a, a chapter name no or like a or yes i don't know how you describe the the define itself or the nugget title or whatever and also a way a recommended way to use it no because um for example like when in this case this is like a list of aspects in which nuggets are powerful uh, uh, ways in which they are powerful and then you can imagine saying well this is a type you know type of nugget list so then other people could add items to the list without having to you know necessarily uh, go and edit the text you, maybe you can have like more like parallel editing you say like you know <clears throat> yep. uh, and that's sort of like a, an easier way to collaborate maybe because uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of this in our terms this already will work like this if I had a node called uh, seven node called nuggets are really powerful, it will sh just show up as a separate file, right? Uh, right. Uh, under here, but we could have uh, we, we could have like in the side builder or in the owner, we could have like an allowance that actually collapses it into one list, right? So essentially, we will be um, uh, working on separate documents, but then rendering them as one. Uh, and, and I think there's a few of these, uh, the, the, the parallel versions also, like, uh, I guess, um, work with some allowances. Yep. There's also interesting questions about, okay, I'd love to have conversations or interactions around any piece of any of this. Where to put those? <clears throat> should should the should the mm -hmm. chat be around the nugget in Markdown? Should, and, and should it be a plugin like Discourse? Uh, or, or, or whatever, or should the chats be um, separate from in a in some conversation space, or on Hypothesis, or wherever else? And and too too many of these, and they become dissipative, so that there isn't a critical mass for the conversation, and you also lose, lose track of them, and you can't figure them all out. Um, so I'm I'm not sure which ones I even prefer. Uh, but but I'm extremely interested in and one of the things I think a really good nugget can do is it can point to anybody who hits that nugget toward where the conversation the hot conversation is on that topic so they can go see it and maybe join. Right. 
so for example, um, the nugget, this nugget for nuggets are really powerful might point toward fellowship of the link. Right, which I guess it will be more like right here. Uh, so like adding a, a link like this will at least, uh, you know, well, have that link. Yep. But yeah. Yeah, interesting. So, and so the book itself is a simplified linear snapshot at a moment in time <clears throat> of a bunch of ideas. Yes. And that makes the ideas easier to digest because they're like ordered in, in you know, in some linear way. Um, but it's also way limited compared to when you deconstruct the ideas and make them more useful. And then uh, at the bottom it says software that instantiates the nuggets, or where you just were. Um, uh, one of the one of the last items on that list was uh, software that instantiates uh, what the nuggets say, right above where yeah. you were. Yeah, um, that I, I think we've had that conversation here before. Um, I called I call I've been calling it instrumentation. That's not the right word. I just don't know what the right word is. But I have a feeling that some small percentage, maybe it's ten percent, maybe it depends on the subject matter, of course. But some some nuggets are very amenable to turning into software. And they should, and they should be easily available, and they should find their way toward wherever they mean to be in the world. Um, right. So I've got to explain that a little bit better there. But but that's just one angle for what's interesting about nuggets. It, it, definitely. I mean, I, I, I will maybe, I guess the way I'm thinking about this as you, as you describe it, I go back to this notion of type, mm -hmm. just like uh, if not uh, for the final uh, result or, or, or like set of patterns, just uh, to help maybe think about like the uh, the scope of um, what we want to do here. And like, for example, like software could be uh, either a type of nugget. So essentially a nugget could be like a piece of code or uh, it could be like an output. So maybe uh, you have nuggets which have different types and you have outputs which are like, you know, things you can do with the nugget. Um, the transformations and so on. Mm -hmm. Pipelines, right. Yay. Um, Chris, I think you, you have a, a way of, of seeing the stuff that I'm working on and, and understanding it pretty deeply. I, I don't know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, oh, on this. One of the things I've always wanted to do too in playing with things like this, particularly in online spaces for books, um, and it's supportable even with small snippets of code, but to, if you're licensing it and allowing your thing to go out into the world, part of it is people will encounter it and see it and want to know where is the original? How often has it been cited? You know, how has yep. it changed? Those types of things. And I, I think some of it is probably mentioned in that OER link, because the usually in the OER space they talk about the five R's. You know, for essentially portability and reusability. Um, and the one thing they haven't gotten down yet is how to kind of heavily respect the original or allow the original to be seen and found so that instead of making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that may likely have changed over time, what did the original look like versus the version I'm looking at now? And maybe I want the original, um, so baking in things like um, uh, web mentions, which I've had examples of before. Um, and pr I think probably the best one I've got, even though it didn't require licensing or intent, but Andy Matushak took some material I wrote and put it into his kind of online notebook which a lot of other people refer to within the note taking space. Um, but because he put a link into his thing, 
even though he didn't support web mentions, somebody clicked on it once, so I got what's known as a ref back. And my WordPress site treats that, or takes those as incoming and treats them like web mentions. Hmm. So I get a notification on my original that it has been mentioned in another book or another thing somewhere online. That's um, great. But it's, you know, and, and almost even for that reason, I can almost kind of like some of the more restrictive <coughs> licensing modes because it encourages people to at least credit the original, even if they steal it whole hog, so that yep. you're more likely to get a link back to it to know, hey, this thing lives somewhere else rather than it just be, could be hiding out there for all you know, you'll never know and never understand. Um, but then doing it with, um, and if you're getting those, whoever reused it may add something to it that is super useful to the original book or playlist the thing lives in. And you may want to take those ideas and bring them back into your original and then update your original. Um, and so things like, you know, GitHub or various versions that will allow you to do versioning of material like that can kind of be a, a more fun playground to like kind of mix the melting pot a little more Absolutely. easily. I guess. One of the reasons to use GitHub is fork and pull also, is that there is an explicit way to contribute. Yeah. Um, that way, if you want to modify the original, potentially you can do it there and then take your copy and use it. Um, but I, yeah, yeah, it's I found it all fascinating. So I'm thrilled to see people like tinkering around in that as a space, especially in online where you know it's much harder to do that with a physical book or even an ebook. Mm -hmm. so, so then, so just to like uh, make sure I understood, uh, that's very, very cool, Chris. Uh, you're always bringing these uh, nuggets precisely of like knowledge from the in the US uh, space, which are very applicable. So. Uh, the idea here uh, in the context of new books will be that maybe use we could use the web mentions to link nuggets, maybe to say like this nugget is a derivative of this one, maybe. Or yeah, this one is or at, least, at least it got mentioned, or it got mentioned and or changed or whatever. So there are different types of metadata you can put onto the links that you use that will provide intent of what that thing is so you know if i had an online book and you excerpted it and linked to it i could get a web the the lowest level web mention would be this thing got mentioned over here and i can show it on that page um there were in fact there was a uh, i don't know if the examples all still work um we're working all browsers because they there's been some changes, but there was a, a physicist named Kardec uh, Prabhu, I think, who created physical marginalia. So you could highlight something on his site and reply to specific lines, and he would show it as marginalia in the margin Ooh. of his posts. Nice. Kind so of like, like the way. So um, distribute the hypothesis. Yeah, medium medium kind of does that, where you can highlight a thing and then comment on a line, and medium will show it. Or if you know, medium will show the most highlighted passages in a thing. But he created UI using web mentions to show that kind of marginalia. Which I, I think, thought was pretty cool. I think Stow Boyd has also been playing with marginalia, like yeah. in, in Obsidian and stuff like that, pretty intensely. Um, oh, that's interesting. Has he posted about that at all? I think so. Let's see if I can find it. He dies, and he's just saying, this such a. It, it well, seems like I, a yeah. I, I was going to say, I find it most interesting with respect to the framing. Uh, and I, it, it existed as an idea before, but I think probably one of the better versions of it is um, 
the the first volume of the great books of the western world um hutchins wrote an essay essentially called the great conversation and you know they he framed it as the reason you want to read books like aristotle and plato is they started a conversation that we're still having mm -hmm. you know thousands of years later and ideally you read something and you take it and make it yours and improve on it and write something else but in reading it, you're not just reading it and wholeheartedly believing everything they write. You, you read it skeptically and you write about it or you change it or you add to it. And that becomes part of the greater conversation of humanity. But having neo books that will allow this or allow changes through time or communication even of one book to older books, particularly if the internet is still the internet a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now, you know, there's, you can go find third century versions of the Hebrew Bible with glosses and writings in and around them. Um, and those things become more layered over time, but it's how do you see those layers so that you can see the original and see how they've changed over time, it becomes a fascinating, of course, building a UI to make that obvious um, becomes a little harder. Doing it in text print is supremely hard. Mm -hmm. And expensive. <laughs> yeah, this is a very fun pond to play in. Thank you. Any other notes? And the other thing I'm trying to do is figure out how to explain this damn thing in order to boost my Patreon take. So I'm trying to rework my Patreon, but I haven't really gotten much progress on that yet. But I, I need to change how I'm doing what I'm doing because I, what I'd really love to do is be funded to do this thing. Uh, you know, and, and to connect this thing to trust and to connect trust to the world, the shit storms that are happening in the world, like all those things at once matter to me. Um, but it's hard to sort of paint an impressionistic portrait of what these things are and how they fit together. So have you gotten a PDF or like a finish or like a, you know, finished draft, essentially full pipeline? Uh, uh, no. Outside? So, so, so mm -hmm. the closest book to publication is probably um, Klaus Mager's uh, writings around soil fertility and regenerative agriculture and, yeah. and then how to explain these things uh, through the, prism uh, or through the, the, the lens of uh, spiral dynamics, which is uh, what he did. Now, he wrote that thing all in a Google Doc. Uh, Pete and I then met separately to export the Google Doc and try to break it up into markdown files. And there's a whole bunch of messy uh, codes that show up when you when you do the export there, you know, and you go to plain text. There's a whole bunch of funny codes. We don't know what they are. So we got kind of stuck there. Because our Sorry, did you was... use the print preview mode or just different thing? Because I actually don't remember how we did the export. I think um, I should go check that again. I'm happy uh, to like I've done no because because but uh, I've done like an export and I have to deal with some stuff. So happy to uh, cool. I, I will join the matter most. Uh, yeah, thank you. That'd be great. That's a yeah. that's a good good place for that conversation because Pete's on there as well. Yeah. Um, and so the the book that's closest to being a book and to be exported is that, but Pete and I have to kind of figure out what to do. And Pete uh, Pete has been volunteering his efforts to sort of go do different parts of this. Uh, it would be great to be able to fund him to actually do a, a piece of this. So looking at that as well. Um, but the idea then is to take a documentation generator or Pelican or something, I forgot what the different packages are, uh, to take the nuggets, roll them up and spit them out as an ebook or a Kindle file format book, which is the eventual goal. Right. Um, I guess I was asking because once you have like the, a full end-to-end -end example, I think it just becomes way more understandable or readable. Uh, exactly. Exactly. What I'm hoping to get to in the nearer term is a little nexus of nuggets that start to show the power of what this is. 
Uh, so that that's a long ways from finished book on design from trust. What I really want to do too is publish a book about design from trust. So I'm I'm eagerly sort of writing that as well. And I'm rescuing nuggets that got trapped in Scrivener. I tried writing in Scrivener for a while. It was okay as a writing tool, and then I discovered that it's impossible to copy and paste it one chapter from one manuscript into a different manuscript. You just can't do it. Right. And I was like, what a freaking stupid <laughs> idea. So anyway, so I, so I basically lost all faith in Scrivener. Then when I went back to Scrivener, I discovered that my desktop version of Scrivener was corrupted somehow, but my manuscripts were still, because I was syncing them, were still available on my iPad. So I've been copying and pasting bits and pieces from my iPad into iPad Obsidian, uh, where they sync back to my normal Obsidian because I'm paying Obsidian to sync. It's really weird. Like It's the, this little roundabout tour that I'm doing. And then I feel like still a newbie in Obsidian because I know that everybody else is doing all these interesting explorations in Obsidian and I, I don't have time to never mind read them, never mind uh, go do the do all the explorations. <clears throat> yeah, I will feel FOMO. I mean, Obsidian is cool, but it's not open source. So to me, <laughs> I see it as a dead end. But you know, um, this with respect to Obsidian people who are great, I'm sure. Thanks for the link, Chris. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Chris, do you want to comment a little bit on the link that you just put in the chat? Uh, let me pull that link back up so I can actually okay. say something about it. <laughs> um, and maybe even better, I don't know if it'll... Because the Talmud is kind of the Ur hypertext. So oh. I shared a link to a version of the Talmud that has an original text, and then around it are... And it's the original is like a tiny chunk of text, but it's got commentary and I, it's, they're not they're kind of footnotes but they're literally built around the original in the center of the page um, but you've got the Mishnah the Gemara Tosafot you've got a commentary section by Rashi and then some other additional kind of rabbinic commentary around it and then also some index references to some of the legal codes so it's i don't know what one two three four five like six levels of commentary almost on a on a piece of text in a written page um i ha i don't see it often but in a lot of older manuscripts you might have a full huge page but the text only takes up a tiny amount of it and usually you'll see handwritten rulings with lots of marginal space that was either meant for illumination that either happened or didn't happen. But quite often there would be a huge amount of margin space for readers to write their own notes and marginalia and commentary in on the page. Um, in modern contexts, there are still a handful of Bibles that are printed that are called interleaved copies. And if you look on Amazon, it's probably the easiest place to find them. Finding them in bookstores is pretty hard. But you'll find a page of the Bible, and then there will be a blank page inserted in between you know, every other page of the Bible so that as you're reading it, you can write down and make notes and your own commentary as you're reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Super rare to find that with any other books. In fact, I've spent some time looking around to find, you know, there are probably 20 publishers that go out and will take, um, things that have fallen out of copyright. So let's say you, you wanna, you're reading a, in a class, a copy of Moby Dick for a course. You can go out and buy 30 different copies of Moby Dick 
at the bookstore or order them. And, but usually the margins are like, you know, quarter of an inch at best. Um, but wouldn't it be great because you're reading it and almost always in a clash, you're marking it up, you're underlining things, you're writing notes. You may take notes in it while you're reading it with a class, but publishers make it stupidly hard to do that. Um, probably the, some of the best versions are the Norton critical editions based on my measurements. Some of them go up to three quarters of an inch or almost an inch of margin space. So if you wanted to mark it up and write in the margins, those are better. Um, I think every, every man press does kind of an okay job. The folio editions, if folio, the folio society has done it, theirs have some really great margins, but usually those books are a hundred or more if you can find them and they've even published those. Um, but I, I, it kills me that in an era of print on demand, I can't go to Amazon and say, yes, Amazon, I want a print on demand copy of this book. And I'm happy to pay the publisher whatever the cost was for the book itself, but make my copy have blank sheets every other page and I'll pay you for the pa paper and the process and then send me that copy so I can make my own notes in the damn book. Mm -hmm. But uh, how that doesn't exist as a product, like just, I, I don't understand. Well, this is kind of, this is kind of my beef is that the in intellectual property over protection and capitalism have eaten ideas and have destroyed our ability or greatly hindered our ability to not destroy that's an overstatement uh to share ideas and put them to work in the world and i'm trying to reverse that right. particularly though i mean what 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 just saying that doesn't um uh doesn't doesn't even deal with with copyright so much but uh, as a designer and as a former columnar designer um doing things that um that allow for you know i i in book form and magazine form and and other kinds of you know journal form formatting i've done things with repetitive columnar te templates that leave, that let the text, you know, all be one vertical column um, and leave an outboard white space area for images, quotes, footnotes, side notes, as, as um, they were described in the we link to. Um, and it's a great, it's a great design tool. Um, and it's not messing with the, the copyrighted copy, um, the copyright copy, and you know that that kind of formatting is in a print-on-demand world. It's just like it's like a a template, just the way I don't know. You know, somebody who's who's got a Tumblr or a World WordPress doc, you know, uses. Um, uses a particular, uh, you know, skin. What, there's there's something other than a template that's uh, usually used for that. Um, I'm blanking. Anyway, but, you know, I mean, just using a particular template saying, I want this book and that template totally should be a thing. Super easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I would I would design one of those for you know every desired purpose and uh and have them available man yeah but the market i just was wandering around in my brain under marginalia and annotations and stuff like that and found the article i just put a link to in the chat by sam anderson from 2011 what i really want is someone rolling around in the text and uh it uh i didn't have a chance to reread it but it, it looks like it talks a lot about like why are margins so hard to write in I mean, it also seems like it totally should be uh, an ebook thing, 
you know, uh, a Kindle option or whatever, you know, ebook you're using to, you know, look at a book in that way and look at your notes and the notes of others. Yeah. So, so, so here, I guess I, I do think that investing in the digital is a most likely option just because it is the yeah. hardest to prevent people from doing. It is the cheapest, you know, because you don't have to deal with like the issue of economies of scale and zombie printing or on demand. And uh, we already have standards, like the weather rotation standard, <coughs> meaning like too many things to look into the standard uh, more deeply. Uh, is the one that uh, hypothesis uses. Hypothesis is good. Uh, we could just use hypothesis of, of the bat, uh, our own instance, maybe for like uh, nuggets or ebooks in general. Uh, but maybe as well, just like using the basic protocol to to see how whether we can actually annotate in, anything with it. I'm, I'm not sure. I think we can. Uh, and maybe uh, you could even say like, well, I'm annotating page something of this print edition, right? Uh, presumably, and that will bridge the gaps. Love that. Oh, we have gone past our <clears throat> our hour usually. We can roll into the next half hour if we want to, but just noting it. And the recorder is still somehow magically on after an hour. Yeah, I think we started it late. So it's like a... Well, I started it late. Oh, that's right. So the call has been going for an hour and eight. It's about to. Not, but not the recording. So it's about to die. Yeah. Actually, uh, I just want to say it's ironic, but um, the New York Times... Uh, web edition is one of the few places where a central column of, I mean, if you look at that very link to the, the um, Sam Anderson article, you have a text with a third of the page on each side. And as you scroll down, there are some related editor's picks there, but those could easily be, you know, full quotes, graphics, uh, notes of your own. Yeah, um, that's the format. 